Chapter 12 As Swelled in Rangoon Light burst into the tunnel of the, as the doors dragged open. Aragon winced, his eyes sorely unaccustomed to daylight after so long underground. Beside him, Saphira hissed and arched her neck to get a better view of their surroundings. It had taken them two days to traverse the subterranean passage from Farlandur, though it felt longer to Aragon, due to the never-ending dusk that surrounded them and the silence it had imposed upon their group. In all, he could recall only a handful of words being ex exchanged during their journey. Aragon had hoped to learn more about Arya while they traveled together, but the only information he gleaned came simply as a result of observ observation. He had not slept with her before, and was startled to see that she brought her own food and ate no meat. When he asked her why, she said, "'You will never again consume an animal's flesh after you have been trained, or if you do, it will only be on the rarest of occasions.' "'Why should I give up meat?' he scoffed. "'I cannot explain with words, but you will understand once we reach Elizmira. All that was forgotten now as he hurried to the threshold, eager to see their destination. He found himself standing on a granite outcropping, more than a hundred feet above a purple-hued lake, brilliant under the eastern sun. Like Kofsa Myrna, the water reached from mountain to mountain, filling the valley's end. From the lake's far side... The Azragni flowed north, winding between the peaks until, in the far distance, it rushed out onto the eastern plains. To his right, the mountains were bare, save for a few trails, but to his left? To his left was the dwarf city Tarnag. Here the dwarves had reworked the seemingly immutable bjors into a series of terraces. The lower terraces were mainly farms, dark curves of land waiting to be planted, dotted with squat halls, which, as best as he could tell, were built entirely of stone. Above those empty levels rose, rose tier upon tier of interlocking buildings until they culminated in a giant dome of gold and white. It was as if the entire city was nothing more than a line of steps leading to the dome. The cupola glistened like polished moonstone, a milky bead floating atop a pyramid of gray slate. Oric anticipated Aragorn's question, saying, "'That is Sebedil, the greatest temple of dwarfdom,' and home of Durgrimst Quan, the Quan clan, who act as servants and messengers to the god. Do they rule Tarnag? asked Sephira. Aragon repeated the query. Nay, said Arya, stepping past them. Though the Quan are strong, they are small in numbers, despite their power after, over the afterlife, and gold. It is the Ragni Hefvin, the river guard, who control Tarnag. We will stay with their clan chief, Undin, while here. As they followed the elf off the outcropping and through the gnarled forest that blanketed the mountain, Oric whispered to Aragon, Mind her not. She has been arguing with the Quan for many a year. Every time she visits, it, visits Tarnag and speaks with a priest, it produces a quarrel fierce enough to scare a coal. Arya? Oric nodded grimly. I know little of it, but I'm heard, I've heard she disagrees strongly with much that the Quan practice. It seems the elves do not hold with muttering into the air for help. Aragon stared at Arya's back as they descended, wondering if Oric's words were true, and if so, what Arya herself believed. He took a deep breath, pushing the matter from his mind. It felt wonderful to be back in the open, where he could smell the moss and ferns and trees of the forest, where the sun was warm on his face, and bees and other insects swarmed pleasantly. The path took them down to the edge of the lake before rising back toward Tarnag and its open gates. "'How have you hidden Tarnag from Galbatorix?' asked Aragon. "'Farther endure, I understand. But this? I've never seen anything like it.' Oric laughed softly. "'Hide it? That would be impossible. No, after the riders fell, we were forced to abandon all our cities above ground and retreat into our tunnels in order to escape Galbatorix and the Forsworn. They would often fly through the Bjors, killing anyone who they encountered. I thought that dwarves always lived underground. Oric thick, Oric's thick eyebrows met in a frown. Why should we? We may have an affinity for stone, but we like the open air as much as elves or humans. However, it has only been in the last decade and a half, ever since Morzan died, that we have dared return to Tarnag and other of our ancient dwellings. Galbatorix may be unnaturally powerful, but even he would not attack an entire city alone. Of course, he and his dragon could cause us no end of trouble if they wanted, but these days they rarely leave Urubain, 
even for short trips. Nor could Galbatorix bring an army here without first defeating Burag or Farthendur. Which he nearly did, commented Saphira. Cresting a small mound, Aragon jolted with surprise as an animal crashed through the underbrush and onto the path. The scraggly creature looked like a mountain goat from the spine, except that it was a third larger and had giant ribbed horns that curled around its cheeks, making an ergles seemed no bigger than a swallow nest. Otter still was the saddle lashed across the goat's back, and the dwarf seated firmly on it, aiming a half-drawn bow into the air. "'Hurt Durgumst, Field Rostin!' shouted the strange dwarf. "'Orik Thursum men Orkov Aga Aragon rock Durskme Ingutum,' answered Orik. "'Warn Osvana Krohaga Arga, Nek Ak Unstunt Gristabilblerdin.' The goat stared warily at Sephira. Aragon noted how bright and intelligent its eyes were though its face was rather droll, with its, its frosty beard and somber expression. It reminded him of Rothgar, and he almost laughed, thinking how very dwarfish the animal was. "'As judge judge and rost!' came the reply. With no discernible command on the dwarf's part, the goat leap, leaped forward, covering such an extraordinary distance it seemed to take flight for a moment. Then rider and steed vanished between the trees. "'What was that?' asked Aragon, amazed." Oric resumed walking. A Feldunust, one of the five animals unique to these mountains. A clan is named after each one. However, Durgrim's Feldunust is perhaps the bravest and most revered of the clans. Why so? We depend upon Feldunust for milk, wool, and meat. Without their sustenance, we could not live in the Bures. When Galbatorix and his traitorous riders were terrorizing us, it was Durgrim's Feldunust who risked themselves, and still do, to tend the herds and fields. As such, we are all in their debt. Do all dwarves ride, Feldenust? He stumbled slightly over the unusual word. Only in the mountains. Feldenust are hardy and sure-footed, but they are better suited for cliffs than open plains. Saphira nudged Aragon with her nose, causing Snowfire to shy away. Now those would be good hunting, better than any I had in the spine or hence. If I have time in Tarnang... No, he said. We can't afford to offend the dwarves. She snorted, irritated. I could ask permission first. Now the path that had concealed them for so long under dark bows entered a, the great clearing that surrounded Tarnag. Groups of adver observers had already begun to gather in the fields when seven Feldenus with jeweled harnesses bounded out of the city. Their riders bore lances tipped with pennants that snapped like whips in the air. Reining in his strange beast, the lead dwarf said, Thou art welcome to the city of Tarnag. By Otho of Undin and Ganel, I, Thorv, son of Brock, offer in peace the shelter of our halls. His accent grumbled and rasped with a rough burr, quite unlike Oryx. And by Orth Rothgar's Otho, we of the Ingatum accept your hospitality, responded Oryx. As do I, in his Lanzadi's stead, added Arya. Appearing satisfied, Thorv motioned to his fellow riders, who spurred their Feldenust into formation around the four of them. With a flourish, the dwarves rode off, guiding them to Tarnag and through the city gates. The outer wall was forty feet thick and formed a shadowed tunnel to the first of the many farms that belted Tarnag. Five more tiers, each of which was defended by a fortified gate, carried them past the fields and into the city proper. In contrast to Tarnag's thick thickly built ramparts, the bu buildings within, though of stone, were shaped with such cunning as to give the impression of grace and lightness. Strong, bold carvings, usually of animals, adorned the houses and shops. But even more striking was the stone itself. Vibrant hues, from bright scarlet to the, to the subtlest of greens, glazed the rock in translucent layers. And hung throughout the city were the dwarves' flameless lanterns, their multicolored sparks harbingers of the Bure's long dusk and night. Unlike Trondheim, Tarnag had been constructed in proportion to the dwarves, with no concession for human, elf, or dragon visitors. At most, doorways were five feet high, and they were often only four and a half. Aragon was of middling height, but now he felt like a giant transported onto a puppet stage. The streets were wide and crammed. Dwarves of various clans hurried about their business, or stood haggling in and around shops. Many were garbed in strange, exotic costumes, 
such as a block of fierce black-haired dwarves who wore silver helmets forged in the likeness of wolf heads. Aragon stared at the dwarf women the most, as he had only caught brief glimpses of them while in Trondheim. They were broader than the men, and their faces were heavy-set, yet their eyes sparkled and their hair was lustrous, and their hands were gentle on their diminutive children. They eschewed frippery, except for small, intricate brooches of iron and stone. At the Feldenus piercing footsteps, the dwarves turned to look at the new arrivals. They did not cheer as Aragon had expected, but rather bowed and murmured, Shade Slayer. As they saw the hammer and stars upon Aragon's helm, admiration was replaced by shock, and in many cases, outrage. A number of the angrier dwarves contracted around the Feldenus, glaring between the animals at Aragon and shouting imprecations. The back of Aragon's neck prickled. It seems that adopting me wasn't the most popular decision Hrothgar could make. Aye, agreed Sephira. He may have strengthened his hold on you, but at the cost of alienating many of the dwarves. We'd better get out of sight before blood is shed. Thorv and the other guards rode forward as if the crowd was non-existent, clearing the way through seven additional tiers until only a single gate separated them from the mass of Selbidil. Then Thorv turned left, toward a great hall pressed against the side of the mountain, and protected in four by a barbican with two macocolated towers. As they neared the hall, a group of armed dwarves streamed out from between the houses and formed a thick line blocking the street. Long purple veils covered their faces and draped over their shoulders like male coughs. The guards immediately reined in their fedenost, faces hard. What is it? Aragon asked Oric, but the dwarf only shook his head and strode forward, a hand on his axe. Etzil Niklich, cried a veiled dwarf, raising a fist. Form Pekarkarf! Form Juden Kartemidornos Eta Gorf Bastarnag! Der Estetta Rak Kinth! Dok is Vanda as Badiko du Durgrist! As Felden Rak Onun! Mogdor da Junven! Neka Duko Ak Nulag! Nulag on. For a long minute, he continued to rant with glo- growing spleen. Run! barked Thorv cutting him off, and the two dwarves began arguing. Despite the harsh exchange, Aragorn saw that Thorv seemed to respect the other dwarf. Aragorn shifted to the side, trying to get a better view past Thorv's fedenus, and the th- veiled dwarf abruptly fell silent, jabbing at Aragorn's helm with an expression of horror. Nurlag quana kernel dergristim ingatum? he screamed. Quarza on hrothgar on vod... Jok es vada dusgvistemen, interrupted Oric quietly, drawing his axe. Worried, Aragon glanced at Arya, but she was too intent on the confrontation to notice him. He surreptitiously slid his hand down and around his rock's wire-wrapped hilt. The strange dwarf stared hard at Oric, then removed an iron ring from his pocket, plucked three hairs from his beard, twined them around the ring, and threw it on the street with an impervious clink, spitting after it. Without a word, the purple-shrouded dwarves filed away. Thorv, Oric, and the other warriors flinched as the ring bounced across the granite pavement. Even Arya seemed taken aback. Two of the younger dwarves blanched and reached for their blades, then dropped their hands as Thorv barked, Etta! Their reactions unsettled Aragon far more than the raucous exchange had. As Oric strode forward alone and deposited the ring in a pouch, Aragon asked, What does it mean? It means, said Thorv, that you have enemies. They hurried through the barbican to a wide courtyard arrayed with three banquet tables, decorated with lanterns and banners. Before the tables stood a group of dwarves, foremost among them a gray-bearded dwarf, swathed in wolf skin. He spread his arms, saying, Welcome to Tarnag, home of Durgrimst Rangi Heflin. We have heard much praise of you, Aragon Shadeslayer. I am Undin, son of Durand and clan chief. Another dwarf stepped forward. He had the shoulders and chest of a warrior, topped with hooded black eyes that never left Aragorn's face. And I, Ganel, son of Orm Bloodaxe, and clan chief of Durgrimst Quan. It is an honor to be your guests, said Aragorn, inclining his head. He felt Saphir's irritation at being ignored. Patience, he murmured, forcing a smile. She snorted. The clan chiefs greeted Arya and Oric in turn but their hospitality was lost on Oric, whose only response was to extend his hand 
the iron ring on his palm. Undin's eyes widened, and he gingerly lifted the ring, pinching it between his thumb and forefinger as if it were a venomous snake. Who gave this to you? It was Aswolden Rock Anhun, and not to me, but to Aragon. As alarm spread across their faces, Aragon's earlier apprehension returned. He had seen lone dwarves face an entire group of coal without shirking. The ring must symbolize something dreadful indeed if it could undermine their courage. Undin frowned as he listened to the muttering of his advisors, then said, We must consult on this issue. Shade Slayer, a feast is prepared in your honor. If you would allow my servants to guide you to your quarters, you can refresh yourselves, and then we might begin. Of course. Aragon handed Snowfire's reins to a waiting dwarf and followed a guide into the hall. As he passed through the doorway, he glanced back and saw Arya and Oryk bustling away with the clan chiefs, their heads pressed together. I won't be long, he promised Sephira. After crouching through dwarf-sized corridors, he was relieved that the room assigned to him was spacious enough to stand freely. The servant bowed and said, I will return when Grim Grimsporth Undin is ready. Once the dwarf was gone, Aragon paused and took a deep breath, grateful for the silence. The encounter with the veiled dwarves hovered in his mind, making it difficult for him to relax. At least we won't be in Tarnag long. That should prevent them from hindering us. Peeling off his gloves, Aragon went to a marble basin set on the floor next to the low bed. He put his hands in the water, then jerked them out with an involuntary yelp. The water was almost boiling. It must be a dwarf custom, he realized. He waited until it cooled a bit, then doused his face and neck, rubbing them clean, clean as steam swirled off his skin. Rejuvenated, he stripped out of his breeches and tunic and outfitted himself in the clothes he had worn to Ajahad's funeral. He touched Zorak, but decided it would only insult Undin's table, and instead belted on his hunting knife. Then, from his pack, he took the scroll Nasweda had charged him with delivering to Islanzadi and weighed it in his hand, wondering where to hide it. The missive was too important to leave out in the open, where it could be read or stolen. Unable to think of a better place, he slipped the scroll up his sleeve. It'll be safe there, unless I get into a fight, in which case I'll have bigger problems to worry about. When at last the servant returned for Aragon, it was only an hour or so past noon, but the sun had already vanished behind the looming mountains, plunging Tarnag into dusk. Exiting the hall, Aragon was struck by the city's transformation. With the premature advent of night, the dwarves' lanterns revealed their true strengths, flooding the streets with pure, unwavering light that made the entire valley glow. Unden and the other dwarves were gathered in the courtyard, along with Sephira, who had situated herself at the head of a table. No one appeared interested in disputing her choice. "'Has anything happened?' asked Aragon, hurrying toward her. Hunden summoned extra warriors, then had the gates barred. "'Does he expect an attack?' "'At the very least, he's concerned about the possibility.' "'Aragon, please join me,' said Hunden, gesturing at the table at the chair to his right. The clan chief seated himself as Aragon did and the rest of the company hurriedly followed suit. Aragon was happy when Auric ended up beside him, with Arya directly across the table, although both looked grim. Before he could ask Auric about the ring, Undin slapped the table and roared, Inf av vos! Servants streamed out of the hall, bearing platters of beaten gold piled high with meat, pies, and fruit. They divided into three columns, one for each table, and deposited the dishes with a flourish. Before them were soups and stews filled with various tubers, roasted venison, long, hot loaves of sourdough bread, and rows of honey cakes dripping with raspberry preserve. In a bed of greens lay filleted trout garnished with parsley, and on the side, pickled eel stared forlornly at an urn of cheese, as if hoping to somehow escape back into a river. A swan sat on each table, surrounded by a flock of stuffed partridges, geese, and ducks. Mushrooms were everywhere broiled and juicy strips, placed atop a bird's head like a bonnet, or carved in the shapes of castles amid moats of gravy. An incredible variety was on display, from puffy white mushrooms the size of Aragon's fists, to one you could have mistaken for gnarled bark, to delicate toadstools sliced neatly in half to showcase their blue flesh. Then the centerpiece of the feast was revealed, a gigantic roasted boar glistening with sauce. At least Aragon thought it was a boar, for the carcass was as large as Snowfire 
and took six dwarves to carry. The tusks were longer than his forearms, the snout as wide as his head, and the smell, it overwhelmed all others in pungent waves that made his eyes water from their strength. Nagra, whispered Oric, giant boar. Hunden truly honors you tonight, Aragon. Only the bravest dwarves dare hunt Nagran, and it is only served to those who have great valor. Also, I think he makes a gesture that he will support you over Dirk Grimps to Nagra. Aragon leaned toward him so no one else could hear. Then this is another animal native to the Bjors? What are the rest? Forest wolves big enough to prey on a Nagra, and nimble enough to catch Feldenust. Cave bears, which we call Urzadin, and the elves call Bjorn, and for which they dubbed these peaks, though we do not call them such ourselves. The mountain's name is a secret we share with no race, and... Smervorth, commanded Undin, smiling at his guests. The servants immediately drew small curved knives and cut portions of the Nagra, which they set on everyone's plates, except for Arya's, including a weighty piece for Saphira. Undin smiled again, took a dagger, and sliced off a bit of his meat. Aragon reached for his own knife, but Oric grabbed his arm. Wait. Undin chewed slowly, rolled his, rolling his eyes and nodding in an exaggerated fashion, then swallowed and proclaimed, Ilfgaudnith! Now, said Oric, turning to the meal as conversation erupted along the tables. Aragon had never tasted anything like the boar. It was juicy, soft, and oddly spicy, as if the meat had been soaked in honey and cider which was enhanced by the mint used to flavor the pork. I wonder how they managed to cook something so large. Very slowly, commented Saphira, nibbling on her nagra. Between bites, Oric explained, It is custom, from days when poisoning was rampant among clans, for the host to taste the food first and declare it safe for his guests. During the banquet, Aragon divided his time between sampling the multitude of dishes and conversing with Oric, Arya, and dwarves further down the table. In that manner, the hours hastened by, for the feast was so large, it was late afternoon before the last course had been served, the last bite consumed, and the last chalice drained. As the servants removed the tableware, Undin turned to Aragon and said, The meal pleased you, yes? It was delicious. Undin nodded. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I had the tables moved outside yesterday so the dragon might dine with us. He remained intently focused on Aragon all the while he spoke. Aragon went cold inside. Intentionally or not, Undin had treated Saphira as no more than a beast. Aragon had intended to ask, to ask about the veiled dwarves in private, but now, out of a desire to unsettle Undin, he said, Saphira and I thank you. Then, Sir, why was the ring thrown at us? A painful silence crept over the courtyard. Out of the corner of his eye, Aragorn saw Oric wince. Arya, however, smiled as if she understood what he was doing. Undin put down his dagger, scowling thickly. The Nurlin you met are of a tragic clan. Before the riders fall, they were among the oldest, richest families of our kingdom. Their doom was sealed, though, by two mistakes. They lived on the western edge of the Bjor Mountains, and they volunteered their greatest warriors in Vrail's service. Anger broke through his voice in sharp cracks. Galbatorix and his ever-cursed forsworn slaughtered them in your city of Urubane. Then they flew on us, killing many. Of that clan, only Grimps Carvlos, Anhuin, and her guards survived. Anhuin soon died of grief, and her men took the name Osveld and Rock Anhuin, the tears of Anhuin, covering their faces to remind themselves of their loss and their de desire for revenge. Aragon's cheeks stung with shame as he fought to keep his face expressionless. So, said Undin, glowering at a pastry, they rebuilt the clan over the decades, waiting and hunting for recompense. And now you come, bearing Hrothgar's mark. It is the ultimate insult to them, no matter your service in Farthendur. Thus the ring, the ultimate challenge. It means Durgrims to Oswald and Rock Anhuin will oppose you with all their resources, in every matter, big or small. They have set themselves against you utterly, declared themselves blood enemies." Do they mean me bodily harm? asked Aragon stiffly. Undin's gaze faltered for a moment as he cast a look at Gamel. Then he shook his head and uttered a gruff laugh that was perhaps louder than the occasion warranted. No, Shade Slayer, not even they would dare hurt a guest. It is forbidden. They only want you gone, gone, gone. 
yet Aragorn still wondered. Then Undin said, Please, let us have no more talk of these unpleasant matters. Gandalf and I have offered our food and meat and friendship. Is that not what matters? The priest murmured in concordance. It is appreciated. Aragorn finally relented. Saphira looked at him with solemn eyes and said, They are afraid, Aragorn, afraid and resentful, because they have been forced to accept a rider's assistance. Aye, they, might, they may fight with us, but they don't fight for us.